I've gone back on top of the canvas after it's dried, after I've varnished it, and I've used this texture yet, it's kind of hard to see, but all down in here, all this reef and rock, this is all um, a very thick uh, lava gel. And it's all water-based acrylic. So it's called lava gel? Yeah, it's actually called a lava gel, and it's, um, it's clear, so I can tint it any color. And it's got this kind of coarse, like, sand texture to it. And I just trowel that on, on top of the final painting, then varnish it again. So, I mean, you, it's just endless. You can just keep going and going and going. Just fill the textures and, uh, you know, it's just cool. Well, your, your paintings are a majority flat surface. So when you look at them by that, I mean, you're not going to feel the pasto. And pasto is the build up of pigment. But then there's a few things like this where you built up the pack pastel here too. Yeah. So all of a sudden you have this like tactile feel along with it as well. But you don't do that very often. No, I mean, yeah, it's a piece has to, you know, speak to me. I've got to feel it. And, and that one in particular, just the way that the, uh, you know, the motion and the, and the, you know, the fluid part of that painting, I, I thought it deserved that. And, uh, you know, again, it's just all about trying new things and seeing what happens. And it's, it's a very unique piece, you know. Are you still using the, uh, did you still use that drone? Just to get your drone out? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was talking about these aerial pieces last night to a couple of people. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've seen, but if you haven't, you got to get up close to these because I hide these little sailboats. And that one's got a little dinghy off the back. And it, I think that one actually has a, it's anchored up in the lagoon. There's like a little anchor rope off the bow. Um, there is. You can actually see it. Yeah. So it's really cute uh, because it's the like, smallest brush I have. It's just like just a little anchor line. Um, but yeah, I've got a little drone that I'll just fly when I travel at home and just get up and take these aerial pictures just to kind of get some ideas in my mind of just all the different patterns and, and you know textures and it's that is insane to see a bird's eye view of the ocean. You know, it's it, definitely a lot of inspiration for these. But literally, you could just call that a straight abstract painting. And if you're here to take a close look at it, you'll see what I mean. I know I'm trying to point out one inch, one square inch to you, you're 200 feet away. But just all of a sudden, you look at this abstract painting, you're kind of caught with these rhythms, and then you see this little tiny vignette. It is so photorealistic, you can see the little dinghy, you can see the line tied up, and that little bit all of a sudden makes this all make sense. That's Cole's boat in the back. That's Cole's boat. That's our first mate uh, for the part time hookers. If you fish, he's the guy that can never catch fish. So what we do every every time is we chum when he's not looking, and all of a sudden he gets a shark on the line. And he's like, guys, you caught another shark. Four days ago, you, anyone can catch a shark, right? Yeah. He keeps catching these sharks, yeah. and he posts them all over. He's like, yeah, I'm the shark king. And we're like, yeah, you're really good. We like, we chum for half an hour until you get someone on the line. And then we just wait because he keeps catching like little bonnet head sharks. Oh, yeah. He thinks he's winning. That's classic. Anyways, uh, yeah, he's not going to make it long term. But we have a good time with him. Anyways, uh, let's do some QA because so I want to get right to the preview this morning. I want to give you a longer preview today because on Saturday, there's a lot you look at and you start to make your decisions. Don't think of today as the second of three auctions. Think of today as the first half of the big auction today and tomorrow. So I want to do that. But before I go on, do some QA. I, we, I still only do two shows a year with him. Uh, because he doesn't, he can't paint fast enough. This is the most rarefied error of any living artist I have, simply because you take so much time to paint, and you finally have a studio assistant who's going to finally start to prep your canvases, mix your paints. Yeah. Has this guy started started working for you yet? Two weeks ago. Yeah. I mean, it's as simple as just unpacking the canvas and laying them out for me. I mean, believe it or not, <clears throat> that sounds so simple, but that saves me a ton of time. You know what I mean? Um, you know, that I'm pouring all the backgrounds, they're drying, he's helping me move stuff around. Um, so, so far so good, we'll see. You know, you know like Romero, let, let me take it to the other extreme. Greedo, and we're with Greedo, he's got 80 people in his <coughs> He's That's got his great. legal team, and, and he's got his managers, and he's got his I, Instagram girl and all this. Um, he's got three underpainters and they do all work with him. Yeah. And that's a normal thing. That's that's the same as every great artist under Rembrandt. Everyone has used underpainters. Michelangelo didn't paint the Sistine Chapel. Yes, he probably touched a couple of areas with it, but he was the engineer while a group of Italian masters worked under, under him. This is the way an artist has had his work for since the beginning. The reality of it is, is that when I work with Brito, mm -hmm. I, if you, I've had people, someone bought a 300,000 painting here, and he whispered, he said, well, bring, the, bring that collector down. Let's show them Brito Palace. 
I took him down, and I took the collector and his wife down, and when we were in Brito Palace, uh, Romero looked at the back of the coat, and he, and he said, do you want to meet Janice? And Janice is the one who did the other painting with him on the painting. So, and he explained all that, and Janice came up and goes, oh my god, this is one of my favorite paintings. What Romero does is, uh, because when you're at that level, you have to be in five places at a time, he would take the canvas, he takes a pencil, and he marks out the areas and codes where he wants to paint. Mm -hmm. And those big block areas of a Romero Brito painting are were done by one of three other painters that have been with him for 20 years. And he comes in, completes, he cleans it up, and does the oil panel lines, signs the painting. That's a 100% painting by Romero Brito. It's called studio painting. It's done by everybody from Andy Warhol to all the way back to Rembrandt. Literally, Rembrandt worked with the same 22 students as the entire life. Uh, and then you get it, someone as stubborn as this guy. <laughs> and literally, he's never had a, anyone even help him FedEx his paintings. Like, he, he'll do a painting, then he'll spend an afternoon wrapping it and wrapping oh, yeah. it for FedEx. Evan and I have, yeah, we have a packing day. I mean, we've, we've got all these days laid out. It's know, a lot of work. Varnish day, a shipping day, a receiving day, and then, you know, for me, uh, a background, you know, I call it a background day where I, I lay these out and, you know, mix all these colors and, and just get all that to me. Then there's a the whole drawing process, you know, I mean, that takes time. And keep in mind, <clears throat> I'm in a 350 square foot studio. That's not a lot of space. I've got these big, I mean, it's beautiful, it's big vaulted ceilings. Uh, I've got two sets of French doors in my backyard, a beautiful light, but um, I've built these racks to go up because my ceilings are like maybe 15 foot. So I've, I've organized it really well, you know, so, but anyway. You know, work with what you got. You know. It's still, we do six shows. We do six shows a year, and the majority of our solo shows. Them. Yeah. So enjoy this, uh, because I won't have you. I won't have you back for a while. I'm actually looking at a year from now bringing you back to this market. We yeah. got the schedule last night. Yeah. I'm gonna do one cruise, and we're gonna take the kids on the cruise to see all my yeah. kids and, and his son uh, play together. Well, yeah. but it's it's really tough. And I, so I want you to look at this both ways. Appreciate the fact that as he's evolving as an artist, he's gonna finally have a studio guy helping varnish his paintings. But every single facet of every single painting you see in here uh, was done by the hand of Ashton Howard. And that's a rarity. And I don't, if, if I'm enlightening you, I don't need to uh, put shade on the entire process. It's not. When you're a world famous artist, you have to create a body of work that is gonna cover eight billion people, or you're gonna try your best. Uh, you're trying, but you're just, you're way too slow. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Uh, when you do your prints, there was a period last year where he was the best, hottest selling print artist in our entire campaign. Yeah. So we'll fly him down one day and he has to go do a signing of like 4,500 prints yeah. in a day. I'm going next week, actually. Yeah. 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 So this is this bottom is 6,000 square feet. So the room we use is 14,000 square feet. And what our teams do is they create all the prints. He comes in and has to prove every one of them. We have tables set up. It's like Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it's a whole team that works solely with us. They put him uh, down. He takes the music he wants for the entire room. They bring a spread of food for him. We have a great big padded chair. And there's literally one person's job is to literally push him. Literally. And it's hilarious to watch. And he goes through and he's like, stop. And he looks at every print. He has to prove every print. And he hands signs it. Once he stands signed it, that means under American print law, now he's proved it as a fine art work, limited edition, we release it to you. And when he finds a work that he doesn't like the way it came out, because it's never the exact same in these processes, he's like, he just shifts it over. No? Okay. They change the garage. They have to create another example for him. And that's tiring. Like, how many can you sign at a time if you're eating? Uh, I'm usually down there for two days, like, to break it up. <laughs> it's usually like a, a six to eight hour day yeah. for half. It's tiring, isn't it? I've talked to guys doing it, like, it's like, it just, his hand starts to cramp up. Yeah. Uh, so, but trust me, dude, it's the best tired I've ever had in my life. Uh, questions. We're going to do 10 minutes of questions. We're going to start a preview. We're going to get right to it. Who has questions? No, uh, don't be shy, man. He could be about fishing, his life in Pensacola, Florida. He could be about his process. You know, the works he's not painting yet. Get your questions ready. I got one for you. Okay. Uh, this is why I submitted it. Uh, what, what do you want to paint that you never painted? What are, we, what are you going to catch me off guard with uh, next year with painting? That's very cool. Um, it can be a destination, it can be a subject matter, it can be an animal. I don't know. Perhaps it's somewhere uh, I haven't been yet. You know, I, I've got a bucket list trip that I want to go on, and that's to Iceland. And 
and just the way uh, how much are you leaning on that photograph as actual reference versus just ooh I like the way that those four square inches kind of yeah up there. I mean you know I, I don't sit there and paint from photos you know it's more just like a, a remembering that mood and the way way it felt you know just so I can go back in my mind just like okay I, I remember that night that was insane you know just, I'm gonna try and well it's kind of nice because it's that the way I want to feel. When you use creative licenses like that, it's not a specific beach. It can be kind of any beach you want it to be. Is that yeah. Oh, truly, yeah. Um, truly, truly. And you'll find that different coasts have different colors and, and lights. I know the answer is. Yeah. But when we're fishing, like we'll be down in the back country in the flats, mm -hmm. and that's completely different light down there than it is up in Pensa in the Panhandle. Oh, yeah. After we've had like 12 beers. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's different tones in the light, and you know, that light surface you're seeing there yeah. is reflecting five or six times back up into the sky. Oh, yeah. So it depends what gases are in there, if you're over different cities. I mean, this is all the science of a beautiful sunset. Oh, we got humidity in the air, I mean, all kinds of things change. Moves and lighting. Uh, so, you know, I, I can think of all that stuff, remember all that stuff, capture it with a photo, whatever. Um, you know, like I said, I just I try to put all that heart, soul, and energy into that, the feeling of each piece. It's, if it's if I were to show you, if I were to show you this photo right now, to go to photos, it would be pages and pages of just sunsets. And, uh, you know, we, we were in, uh, we were fishing, we were in Key West, or we were in Key West, no, we were in Island Rock. Island Rock. We were in Island Rock about a year and a half ago. Yeah. And we decided we, we passed out at a bar at 9 o'clock or anything. We did. All right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we decided we wanted to go to 5 a.m. And, and we had a captain that morning. No, we didn't have a captain. It was three of us. Yeah, no, we went to the boat. Yeah, yeah. And we went out, and it was the most treacherous rainstorm I've ever seen. We, we were in our rain gear, but at 5 a.m., it doesn't matter. And at one point, the rubber was just leaking. Like, we're just soaking. We're just drinking. And we can't even see in front of us. The boat's just towing along. We're dragging some lines. We're not catching any fish. It's 5 a.m. Cole and I are on our fourth beer already because we realize we're not going to catch any fish this day. And as we're trying to figure out if we're going to survive this day, we couldn't even stand up. The rain was coming sideways at us. And he's at the front, like like he's listening, like he's listening to jazz music, taking photos of where we can find in the sunset. And we're like, you realize we're not going to survive this morning, right? Uh, but it's nice because you kind of appreciate that and you document the other things in life that maybe we don't always appreciate. All of it. A couple more questions. We're going to break. What do we got? Here we go. What's your first name? Laura. This is Laura. Um, huge fan. Told you last night. Thank you, Laura. Um, we have Bayou Nights. Yes. And that's yeah. the one with the pier. That's yeah, the pretty pier. Uh -huh. Yeah. Was that actually in Louisiana area when you? Uh, no, that was the beach. Yeah, that was a Florida inspired piece for sure. Yeah, with the marshes. Um, you know, I grew up on Bayou Tahar, which connects to Pensacola Bay, which ultimately connects to the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many wooden docks I've sat on, fished off of, tied up to. And, you know, um, we're talking about Hickman Island so this year, and all the fire. Right. We want to do a casting blast. Yeah. yeah. 
or possibly go out to the rigs for big uh, yellowfin season. So, but my wife and all her family's from Louisiana. They have tons of acres, so we, we have spent a lot of time over there for sure. I'm sure you're going to have some paintings so will be themed on that one over there too. Yeah. 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 I've been casts where you do three days, two days of fishing, and the last day of pig hunting. Oh, pigs. Uh, I've never shot a gun. I'm Canadian, so this will be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, any questions? Any other questions? Yeah, right over here. We'll do two more questions. We're going to break for our preview. So, associates, take your positions. This is Judy. Uh, what's the medium you use on the canvas? Is coil or um, acrylic? Acrylic, yeah. So, um, you know, everything's water based. Um, even my varnish is water based. Even that texture that I was uh, talking about, it's all water based. You know? Yeah. Got a great comment here. So, yeah. let's talk about when you do a, a, a print. Let's talk about you send that painting in mm -hmm. to our team. You've selected it as a published painting. Yep. We agree with the publisher. So published paintings fall under a different contract. And all of a sudden, that is uh, turned into its first bonnet today. Bonnet today means good to pull in French. It's a term meaning this is the one example of the sample that needs to be proved by the artist. And he's already looked at that, and it's not color correct exactly right. Yep. So he's going to go back down. He'll work with our print master. Our print master is a young lady named Andrea Cornejo. She is the biggest printmaster in the world. It's a very prestigious job, and she's a team of eight people that work with her. They work with the artist before signing, and she'll work with him and say, do you want to use Swiss cube? Uh, do we want to do hand embellishment? Do we want to do gicle? What medium are you thinking? And it's a dialogue, and it's at his discretion to decide where it wants to go. It's awesome. It's like going Christmas shopping. I was like, oh, I want that. <laughs> no, 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 let's, let's do this. In this case, we, so in this case, we create it because we're the publisher. And then, so he saw these two samples for the first time, and to be honest, it's not bad. He said yeah, that needs to be color corrected, and the purple one needs to be color corrected. Yep. So he'll take them back, but I wanted to be able to show you what size they'd be and roughly what they'll look like. And then he goes back down. He'll have some notes on these two works for our print master team. Mm -hmm. Then he's going to come back down and he'll prove them. And once he's approved those, he comes back in a month later, and they've created all the samples. And then he, literally, him, he's the one person. His proof in each one individually is when the signature comes on. And that signature of which we pay uh, for is him saying, okay, this is proved by me 100% and now it's ready for the retail market. They printed a part quest. So yeah. all, of the, all of that stuff. So there's, and that's a really good question. Some of these works are created through Swiss Q printing. Swiss Q is the uh, newest way of advancement in fine art printing. It works in 3D printing. There's only three Swiss Q printers in the world that are created in Switzerland. There's only one in North America. It's a cost of $4.1 million per printer. They don't print in filament, they print in compound, if that makes sense to anyone who's more advanced than I am, honestly. Uh, the compound printing in this works in a three-dimensional way, so we acquired them so that Yakov Agam could fly over and work with us and create sculpture in real time. The Swiss Cube is not just a machine, it's a whole room. It's got flatbed scanners, 3D elements, 3D scanners, uh, radar scanners, and it can work and create 3D elements. It's ridiculous. Uh, so some of these works are created through the Swiss Q process, and it so closely emulates the painting that I have to look in the back of the wrench coat to see how it was created, because a lot of times I'll think it's a painting. And, but we do all the most printing. Yeah, Gicle is the same thing, but Gicle is about 40 years old now. Mm -hmm. And Gicle is a printing process, digital print process, that actually prints in real paint. So it takes the same formats of water or uh, oil-based paints, and you can actually um, create like the artist. And it, Gicle changed the whole world 40 years ago. And now 3D printing is taken up. There it is. And the difference is night and day. Like Swiss Q is just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. That's what these two are. That's on the Swiss Q and the, uh, the other uh, lavender types on Swiss Q. Yeah. Super cool, man. Swiss Q is the, the biggest. It's the most time consuming. The only other artist we work on Swiss Q with right now is Create. Has anybody collected those Create prints? They're like $650, dollars Have you noticed yeah. how perfect they are? Yeah. That's. And they're great. You can rub your hand over it in the same textures you feel, the exact same as the paintings. It's a little creepy. We've got a question from David. Jason was talking about the master printer, and to me and maybe to others, the print or the reproduction actually looks a little brighter and more contrasting. To me, right. as a photographer too, I, I like that. What? How do you, do you go? Yeah, I like it, but. It's not like the original, do you go, or do you allow that to, good question, to be the print? That is a good question, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I will go back and color correct. 
for me, that's that's very important. Like you can see the print, especially uh, let's say in the waterfall area, or let's just say the white. You see that magenta, that faint uh, hint of pink. That to me, I would color correct. I want that to look more like the original. Um, but it's up to the artist. The artist can decide. If the artist wants the print to be more saturated, the print is its own yeah. embodiment. It's an interpretation from the painting. So sometimes artists will say, because it's going to be printed on metal versus my canvas, I want them to have their own look. Yeah. And they'll say, uh, they'll say to Andrea, ooh, let's saturate that one up and see what happens. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you like that better. But a lot of artists will come and say, although that's shiny and fantastic, I would like the, that to be a closer representation. And oftentimes, when you're printing on metal versus canvas, you naturally come up more saturated, which is why the purple piece is more saturated, yeah. which is why this one's more saturated. You and will get that in the print process. Yeah. You'll have darker parts, you know. Um, but to me, I like that. You know, I, I like that saturation. Right now. So color is more important than saturation. In his case, Correct. yes. Yeah, in my eye, you know. Like Lilo, when he when he did a print process, he would use uh, Coldograph, which is uh, heat sublimated inks dyes into wood panel, and all of a sudden the painting looked great. But the the Coldographs on wood were so dynamic, he loved it. He said, "I like my paintings to look like paintings, and I like my prints to look like prints." And there's no wrong way to do it. It's just whatever the artist approves. It's a brilliant, it's really interesting that you brought that up. So a lot of people kind of come to that after a long time. Uh, and these, you know, we don't know. He may choose these to stay saturated. I think I know you and I think you're going to want to tone that down a bit. Yeah. Because I know the way he works. But it's really up to the artist 100%. Yeah. Wow, that was brilliant. No one's ever asked that. Good question. All right, well, yeah. Yeah, so Victoria was asking, the prints in this case is on metal. Yeah. Um, and it's not always the case. You can do these prints on canvas. The Create Works are Swiss Q printing on canvas, which you'll know if you collected those. I think we're going to show those as a surprise later today. No more surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then uh, for these works, these are on metal. And it just, his substructure works a bit better for metal. Uh, and the reason why is because, uh, like Create, for instance, is large bodies of color. That can sustain and suspend itself well through printing on canvas. His stuff is so direct and is so precise that the, the more stern the substrate, the more accurate the printing process can replicate it. So it tends to work out better. But you never really know. I mean, you're not hit, you're not walking up to a machine in these processes. These processes are done by people working with the actual equipment to do this stuff. You don't hit a, a, a green button and come back in an hour and 200 are spit out. In the dye sublimation process, uh, each example is created one at a time. Yeah, they are. Uh, it, it, it takes like so many uh, people to be overseeing this process, ultimately an artist. So there's still a lot of creative cre creativity that takes place and has to in the print process. Yeah. Uh, print has become this derogatory term. I use print in fine art in terms of print being under the manipulation of the artist, ultimately. Uh, we use print now, meaning somebody went to a welded building and hit a can of printer, which are two very different things. But thank you for bringing it up, because I never get the chance to really discern that. We have a question here. This is all good stuff. This is Angela. Um, in regards to where you are going to do the publishing, are you going to keep the limit uh, at a low number of how many can actually be reproduced? Yes, I will. Uh, we haven't decided on these new ones yet, because they're so brand new. Um, it's a contract. It's a whole thing for everything. Yeah, typically, they're like maybe anywhere from 300 to 500 pieces. And then there's artist proofs that are embellished. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my range on this. I can tell you the first example of these. So we, we know the tirage of these two to start. The tirage is the description of the embodiment of the entire campaign. So these this is going to be created in 200 examples first, and this can be a VIP edition. So they'll be annotated by hand VIP. 200 examples are going to be created through the Swiss Key process. They're going to be hand signed. They're going to go into the world. They're going to sell it. These two examples for these two will probably sell in less than a month. And what happens then, it goes into a regular edition which you'll see predominantly through the cruise ships. That's going to be 450 examples. And then that will that'll probably sell out in two months, because you have to understand, 275 auctions a week, millions of collectors. Um, that may seem a lot to you, 650. That's nothing. That's where the publishing stops. And then that image, particularly this image, uh, and that image, these images go into licensing. And that's where you start to use them for advertising, uh, campaigns, uh, merchandise. He owns his own t-shirt company. It's just, uh, he's sued another company because we're trying to use the same name. So I, I don't mind sharing your business. Good times. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but he can then take that image because he owns it in perpetuity. And he can take that and issue on t-shirts. Here's the thing. Uh, you may think, ooh, I, I don't want it to be, I don't want it to be shown that much. Well, you do. Every time it's licensed, every time it's published again, the market cachet goes up. Because it doesn't matter. I mean, it, you know, if there's 40,000 prints, that just means the work is even more well known because there's still only ever one painting. And that's the best part. The more people know about your painting, the better it is. And that's why you pay a premium for published paintings in the first place. But I can tell you these are going to be a tirage of 200 first and then 450. But it's a whole separate contract with the artist and, in this case, our CEO on published works. But you guys are like, this is the most advanced question. Oh, ever asked. Good. I thought they were going to say, I thought someone was going to say, can you paint a turtle? I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's get to it. You guys have been patient enough. Let's have some music.